He says, please give me your thoughts on these crazy Olympic races. Anna Kiesenhofer's solo win. MVDP's strange issue with a disappearing ramp. That's Vanderpool's uh, issue. Pidcock running away with it. Carapaz's, or Carapaz's solo win. And Yolanda's absolute dominance. So I, let's just start. Spoiler alert, just so you know. <laughs> we just ruined the whole Olympics. <laughs> you lost the Olympics. <laughs> <laughs> Good point, Nate. <laughs> I should have <laughs> <been>, yeah. <laughs> it's been a couple of days for all of those, so I hope it's okay. We didn't even talk about the time trial there, so... Um, Okay, can we start with Kiesenhofer's win? She was the mm-hmm. the the woman that won the women's pro uh, uh, or the women's Olympic road race. Um, that for she, context, uh, sorry, Nate, go ahead. I was gonna say she posts in our forum, like yes. before she won, she posts a whole bunch, so you can in our forum speak to gold medal Olympians. Super duper yes. cool. Super cool. Um, so uh, from the gun, she was, or I, I guess yeah, from the gun, she was with from the first the gun, breakaway. Yeah. And then the breakaway, the attrition started happening in the break in the breakaway. Then it was four, then it was three, you know, that sort of a thing. And it was just her up there. And she stuck a solo move from the gun in the Olympics and got gold. And she's not a pro cyclist currently. I believe is she is she a PhD candidate right now? Um, or is postdoc. she postdoc? So yep. and she's a mathematician. That's like her, that's her lane that she like owns and loves. Uh in it's just a really, really cool story that like, it, because like the history of the Olympics with the amateur athletes too, I find it really cool that like, you know, an amateur athlete is the one that won. And it, I just, it's super cool. Has, I think it's amazing. Has there been an Olympic road race that has won in such a hard, that's like the hardest way to win. Yeah. And wasn't it right. a breakaway three people? I think it was three. And then it went I down. to like, three, it was. And then yeah. she attacked out of the break. Yeah. Oof. It's just like, I do, and, I think and the also commentators mentioned that it happened one other time. So maybe it has happened before, but that is so impossibly rare. And so impressive uh, uh, on her, that effort and the mental fortitude to be like, I'm sticking this against an entire field and against the Dutch team. And (laughs) they're like, like three absolute hitters. And like, I I just, I was astounded by that. Super impressed. There are a lot of people that were saying, well, it was because they didn't have radios and because they didn't have radios, the team's got miscommunication and that's the reason she won. And I just think that that is so terrible. First of all, I think that's ridiculous to say Yeah, it's part of racing and the the whole Peloton knows going in, they do not have radios and they still got time checks for motos. They still got that information. Johan Brunil uh, had mentioned, he had, always has a lot of insight on stuff. He had mentioned the fact that he thinks that the Dutch team perhaps confused the remainder of the breakaway with her going up the road. Yeah. But this is all part of racing. You have to make sure you right. get the information, right? Like, well, they that's didn't. What it is. They, they didn't catch the remainder of the breakaway for like until like four k to go. Yes. So like they were cutting it pretty close. I also Amber, I'm, you know way more about women's road racing than any of us do. But I in the Olympics, it's I feel like I don't know if this is true or not, but it's less of a team thing. Like they might say they're a team, but like the Dutch team, all three of those women could have won a gold medal. Yes. <laughs> and I just see like when you work, there might be something in your brain too. It's just like, I'm going to put up 10 less Watts here because I got to save something for the end where I think in professional road cycling, it's very much so. This is the role. This is who we're going for. Uh, and it's not just one day over four years. Do you think that played any part of it? I honestly, I'm going to say no. And the reason for that is when you get to that level, there is a, there is a genuine, there's a genuine sense of team that you learn and that goes really, really deep when you get, when you're racing at the professional level, let's say, let's say on a trade team. Um, a lot of people think, okay, well, you're getting paid to set up a teammate for the win. So that's why you're doing it. And trust me, that does not hurt, but (laughs) it is so much more than that. And when you're at the Olympics, it's, you know, you may have a different Jersey on, um, but you're representing your country and the pride that you would have in getting one of your compatriots on the podium is really, really powerful. And the Dutch women in particular race incredibly well as a team. Um, it can be difficult when you're not used to racing together as a team in that combination. But again, at that level, every single athlete in that race knows how to race as a teammate and is really, really good at that. And also in these races, especially the one day races, and especially a race like the Olympics, it's really, really unpredictable. So racing as a team doesn't always necessarily mean that you're giving up your shot because in that case, um, and if you talk, if you read some of the interviews about how they were playing it out tactically, 
it wasn't that they were setting it up just for one person. They had a lot of cards to play. It was just about who was going to cover what, when, and how was the race going to tactically unfold. And because they had so many cards to play, it really could have gone to any one of them because they that's are really I mean. heavy hitters. Yeah. yeah that's, that's what, what I mean. Maybe. Yeah. I don't think if they only had I one car and everyone else is working for them. I don't think it incentivizes selfishness in the way that, that you think it might. I really don't. Um, those, not selfishness is just like, we got to make sure we all don't work too hard because we all could win. Like our chances of winning are higher if we all don't work really hard yeah. rather than just one person and everyone else is going to like pop before the end. It's like, yeah, saying, but I, I think it's, I think that plays much less of a role than you might think it would. I really do. It dominates yeah. our local, uh, week light week night racing, uh, <laughs> all of us just <laughs> racing like crazy, but yeah, yeah, maybe at that level it's different. It, man, it, what, like just, I'm super impressed. And a lot of people were saying that like, well, she's a mathematician. So she had calculated this, she had done all that. And while I'm sure that she was running some splits and she probably can do math a whole lot better in her head than I can when I'm on my bike. Um, but with that said, I think that let's not like just completely remove the racer from this woman. Like mm -hmm. she made a gutsy move and she put it out on the line <clears throat> and she, that was a bold move and a brave move and she made it happen. So it's not like it was just like, oh, it was calculated. She just had to color by numbers the whole way through. You know, it wasn't, that's not the case, even though she probably was able to do a whole, a whole, a cognitive level much higher than us. She still I had the same there. remarks to myself when I was watching the TT, because, you know, they're trying to reduce it to math in the case of the women's road race. They were trying to reduce it to physics in the case of the men's time trial. And I'm, and I'm sitting there biting my tongue, listening to these commentators say, it's all physics, it's all physics, it's all physics. Yeah, physics is crucial, but it's not all physics. There's, there's physiology, there's psychology. There are so many other things in physics that are going to de help determine who wins something yeah. like that. It's not just who's the most arrow and who has the greatest power. There are other things at play. Let's, let's so spoil, so let's spoil that. Yeah, wait, wait, let's no, spoil I'll talk more that about race. the road race. Can I talk okay, more about yeah, this? Yeah, go ahead. So I think too, her strategy going in as being, um, the off the gun from the gun attack works really well if you are not marked. Mm -hmm. Like if one of the really big heavy hitters did it, the, they wouldn't let them go. So that's a perfect strategy. You know, hey, I'm not marked. Great strategy to do that. And especially too when everyone else around him, if, if all the people, this is this goes for if you're in a breakaway too. If you're in a small breakaway, and there are many people who think they can win, but they say there's three or four, and those are the people to watch. And then you attack from that group. Everyone looks for those people to cover. Even more so, each other. yes, <laughs> even more so if there's like one person like named Wout, if you're the one in there and especially if you have a good sprint, they look for that person and then cover, um, two, her knowing that there's no radios, that's the best time to go for a long breakaway that totally. like, you don't, you don't have the information. And I think that is, I think there shouldn't be radios in pro men's racing. It makes it so much more exciting. And two, the confusion of in being in the Peloton, just in my, you know, local category, USA cycling races is there three people off the front or two like <laughs> and you could probably totally. i don't know if amber if you guys got yeah. used to that of having radios of not having to count but when i would race i like really have to count and then it gets confusing in other races because many people from other races drop back but it can be if if they i don't know they they had to have known there were there was one woman off the front uh, from um the time check from the motor right but still, it, it seemed like there was some confusion at the end and stuff like that. But again, just great strategy to be able to do that. And even if there wasn't confusion, I don't know if they're going to be able to pull her back. She had a pretty big lead. Yeah. yeah. I mean, first of all, she's not a nobody. I mean, she's she wasn't one of the marked favorites for sure, but she's not a nobody. She's she's an extremely strong, you know, athlete who has a track record. I mean, national champion. I think she was what fifth in the European TT, maybe. I mean, mm -hmm. she's very, very strong. Um, but to your point, Nate, I think with the radio, there's a lot of, the question of the radios is interesting to me because when I first started racing professionally, we use radios in all of our races. And then there was the ban on the radio. So I've, I've kind of raced through those two eras, if you will. Um, and even when you have a radio, what, what a lot of people don't understand about the radio is it is slow. It is really, really slow. And you guys know from being in a bike race, things happen really fast and you have to make decisions and react in a split second. You don't have time to check in with the radio. Sometimes you can get some supplemental information that's a little bit helpful. Maybe you can get more frequent time checks than you would from the moto in the race. 
but the actual information that you have in the moment you have to make a tactical decision is almost no different. Um, and mm -hmm. so I, I think if you're talking about the Tour de France, that's very different. You have the directors in the car, they have a live feed of the race. They can see things in real time, but in most professional bike races, that's not the case. You have a director who's in a car in the caravan, if you're lucky, <laughs> who is relying on you in the Peloton to give them information about what's going on. They also are on race radio. So the officials will be telling them the numbers of the riders in a break and what the, the time gaps are. Um, but again, that's a really slow back and forth and you don't always have time to get that information before you need to make a decision. And so especially at that level, even if you're used to using radios in the world tour, those athletes are really, really good at being aware of what's going on in the, in the race and aware enough that they can make those decisions in a split second. That's not to say things don't get confusing sometimes, but even when you don't have radios, like Jonathan mentioned, you do have the officials on the motos who are, they, what they do is they hold up a whiteboard and they give you time gaps to different groups. Sometimes they'll have the numbers of the athletes in each group. If it's a small group, it depends on the official and the time. So they may have been relying on that. Who knows what was on the whiteboard? Who knows how gassed everybody was and not thinking clearly. Um, but I, I, I don't think, I don't think that we can say that that is, you know, that is certainly not why Kiesenhofer won. I mean, mm -hmm. she is a phenomenal athlete. She wasn't making any calculations except to say that this is the tactically savvy move for her to make. And any yeah. tactical move is a gamble and you don't mm -hmm. know if it's going to work out, but she stuck it. It's not that she, that that's the reason why she won, but it was a smart move to make, I think, because of the circumstances, the course, the yeah. not being the, the favorite and not having radios. It's just like, it's just like a little extra 1%, right? On oh, each yeah. one of those. It's not like a 90% reason why she won. It's just a it little- defi It defines yeah. calculated risk, right? It's still a risk, but yeah. from beforehand, it's the best risk to take. Like, right. uh, and know, so. the athletes behind her took a calculated risk in letting the break go mm -hmm. another calculated risk, right? I mean, everybody is, is kind of trying to gauge the risk reward benefit of all these decisions and, and making those decisions in a split second on the fly. And it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's not easy, but these are the best athletes in the world and they, they know what they're doing. So, um, yeah, yeah. On the TT note, uh, we're going to spoil that one too. Primos was the only <laughs> one I saw against like the top 10, maybe on a chart. He was the only one that negative split. Everybody else had positive mm -hmm. splits on that time trial. So to your point, Chad, like, like you can have the greatest aerodynamics and the best, like, you know, power producing capability and all that stuff. But if you blow up and go out too hard, like, I mean, I've Here's never done that, so I wouldn't know. But, um, mm -hmm. if you ever go out too hard, then <laughs> you can really jeopardize the rest of the race. So. Um, can we talk about the ramp thing with Vanderpool? I don't know if anybody saw that in the cross country race. Mm -hmm. Um, but so for world cup and for those that don't know for world cup racing, when they have drops or gaps, they have, uh, they have ramps or bridges in place in training before you race that's commonplace. And then it's understood that then when the race is live, they remove those and they make sure that that's communicated through the communicate that they put out. Uh, that was also communicated in this case and reportedly. Vanderpool's team or the, uh, the Dutch team manager said it was communicated to Matthew and the rest of the team that that ramp would be moved. And then even Milan Vader, his teammate said, yeah, we were talking about it when we were eating together in the cafeteria or whatever. So, <clears throat> but I think that if you watch, there's a video of Vanderpool coming over the top of that rock. It 100% looks like he is pushing down off that drop, expecting a ramp to be there and it's not yep. there. So I think he just made a mental error of like, maybe he didn't, bring he's you know at the olympics is his biggest goal that he's had for years and lots going on and he maybe he just blocked that out when people told him or maybe he forgot about it in the moment it's easy to make those mistakes especially when we're seeing cross side from a hard effort because yeah. it really did look like he was expecting it to be there and it wasn't that said i think because he's extremely skilled on the bike but i think not having a dropper post really like sealed that fate because if you look yeah. at it when he pressed down, hoping that ramp would be there, his bike's at a crazy angle. And then what happens is the saddle's in your stomach at that point when you're that far back. And that saddle then on your stomach becomes like a new hinge point for your body, really high center of gravity. And from that point, that's where your body hinges. 
So he had, if he didn't have a dropper, I think with his skills, he probably could have pulled it off. Like it would have looked like the Yolanda Neff thing when she had to exactly. dodge Pauline. He, he could have saved it if he were capable of getting lower, just like Yolanda did. She had to react in, you know, a, a fraction of a second, but she did what was necessary, what was natural because her saddle was out of the way. She could. She yeah. Because and she also poor equipment choice. Yeah, I'll stand by this and I might catch flack for this, but I think that she is the most technically sound, particularly with body positioning, mountain biker in the world, male, Period. female, everything. She yeah. is, you can't take a bad picture of her on the bike. It always looks like the perfect position of where you should be on your bike. She's incredible. So like, you know, we're comparing him to her. He's incredible as well, but she, I believe truly is like on another level with her skills. So, but, um, and then I just thought it was really cool to see Nino race that race. Like he was going to win. He was going all in for that. And he's a champion and he is like the coolest champion. I can't remember it. You, you tend to dislike dominant athletes when they're, when they dominate for years, right? Like people <laughs> started to not like Michael Jordan when he just continues to win forever. And that, that tends to happen. Um, Chris Froome, Brad Wiggins, Lance Armstrong, um, probably for other reasons, but there with him, it's never that way because he's, while sure it's entertaining to see somebody else win when he was just winning everything for years, he's just a consummate champion. He's a super impressive guy. And he raced that race to win and you could see it. He was putting all his cards on the table. And I thought that that was super respectable for him to go out there and to give it. Cause I think that he knew that it would be real tough for him to win, but he still raced uh, like he could win. And that was really cool to see. So that course looked so hard. I don't <laughs> know that, that like the technical side, but then the climbs were so steep. They were like, I think Sophia mentioned, maybe Sophia could be getting this wrong. We're going to have her on. She got 23rd, by the way, which is incredible in the Olympics. Like five years ago, she didn't even know that she didn't even, she was like me, the Olympics, no way, you know, like, so to see her do that is just so cool. But I think that she had mentioned that she was dropping to a 30 tooth chain ring, which for her at like five Watts per kilogram, basically that's really low. Like they usually run higher than that, but it's, it was just so steep. That course just <laughs> looked so hard. Um, yeah, super, super, super cool to see. And kudos Yolanda. Just so cool to see her win. Two more. So do we want to talk about the Pitcock or? Um... Yeah. yeah. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, Pitcock. Go. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. Pitcock. I haven't uh, seen it yet. Okay. So he's hmm. like, I don't know. He's got to be like the most the best the most well-rounded cyclist in the world. I know we say that about Vanderpool, but mm. Pitcock's really I'd close to Vanderpool. And Van Arts. Yeah, that's true. Right. Yeah. It'd be tough, but he's so good. And like, if you look at it, he managed that race. He was not up against the wall the whole time. He got his gap and he managed it. Like he's in, he's incredible. Uh, well, that, that's I, what was so heartbreaking about Vanderpool's F up is, is we had the showdown. <clears throat> I mean, mm -hmm. it had built for five years between these two fellas. And honestly, outside of wow, Van Art, they're the three, I mean, no one else. Yeah stacks up against them across disciplines. And a lot of the times within disciplines, they're incredible yeah. riders. So to watch Vanderpool tank it early on because of a bad equipment choice was heartbreaking because that was going to be an incredible race. And in the race for, for uh, bronze was what could have been the race for gold. If Vanderpool hadn't crapped up. I agree. Yeah. It, it was a bummer for sure, but he's just on Tom's like on a different level. Oh I, yeah. He's on I the level of it. Vanderpool and Van Art. Yep. He was really smart the way he did it in the race. Um, this is most of us never race at the pointy end of races. So this probably isn't the best advice, but, uh, what he did is he sat in, first of all, he had a bad start position. He worked his way up after the start loop. He was in like seventh and then he just kind of slowly worked his way, kind of picked guys off and you could tell he was trying to stay within himself. And then at one point, I think Nino was going crazy hard and then he kind of sat up and he went to the front and he pushed it pretty hard and the, everybody stayed with him, but there were little gaps opening up and then they'd close down over and over. And then they got to the start, the start finish line, the flat area. And Tom basically did a track stand, like forced everybody to come around him. And I think that in that moment he slowed up, nobody came around him. He really slowed up. They still didn't. And then he basically did the track stand and they came around him. And I think at that point he was like, okay, I've got all of you guys on the ropes. So he sat in and then as soon as they got to a steep part of the climb, because his power to weight ratio has got to be insane being such a small athlete too. He just absolutely drilled it on the steep part of the climb. So I think that he was gathering information there. Like where are these guys at? 
I'm feeling really tired, but where are they at? And then he sensed that on the flat section and then just knew he had to hit him where they, it hurts most. So I was super impressed with that, but um, yeah. And then uh, Yolanda, it was like peak Yolanda seeing her just doing what she does best without any of like the early going too hard or the crashes or anything else. It's just cool to see. She's incredible. So, yeah. Uh, Carapaz. Yeah. I, I um, He mentioned that he didn't have team support for this one, basically. Like Ecuador was kind of like, you're on your own. Um, he even said that like this medals for me, it's not for Ecuador, which I thought was a very bold statement. Wow. But what he was getting at was saying that like the, the nation didn't support him uh, as they would for other nations. So he was there, he had one teammate, um, but that was, you know, pretty minimal support. And it's just, I think it's really cool to see that guy win. I know the internet for some reason likes to dislike him, but <clears throat> what an incredible athlete. And Why? He's so, pure I, class. There's, there's nothing. I, I know. Like right. That. I don't know. And I think that they disliked that move when he was uh, suffering and they, and they said poker facing and faking it and then attacking in the tour. It's like, that's what everybody does. <laughs> and that's part of road racing is, is playing things close to the vest and attacking when you need to. So I so. saw the men's and women's road race, um, and the, the men's, this is, I think was so great. So that, so I forgot who, uh, McNulty attacked, right. Yep. And yeah. then maybe like a second later Carapaz went and there was a group of five or seven, but Wout Van Aert was in that group and Wout has ju had just won the a sprint finish in the Tour de France and uh, what Alpe d'Huez, what up yeah. to Mont Ventoux oh, and a time Mont trial, yeah. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, right? So, yeah. uh, if you're Wout, Wout has to know that no one else is going to cover anything of Wout's there because if you pull Wout to the line, he's going to out sprint you for sure. <laughs> If like, you pull him up is, to the top of a climb, he's going to outclimb you. If it's like yeah, a like, long break, he's going to out solo you. It's like, exactly. <laughs> there is, Wout has, I feel, the responsibility from everyone else there is like, everyone's looking to Wout. And, mm -hmm. and Wout has to go until he drops, pretty much. And because he didn't go right then, he should he should know that Carapaz could go, right? And McNulty. There's, uh, everyone in that break was, breakaway was dangerous. Uh, but because that was, it was too big. And he, I felt he started pulling maybe like, three minutes later, four minutes later, but it was too long. And I don't, I don't know. I, I felt like he, he would have, he could have covered it quickly and then everyone else would have came. It's just the, it's the problem of being a marked writer is it's, it's worth going back and rewatching because if they played it right, then they were banking on him not being ready at that moment. So they, so they may have timed it such that he had yeah. just done something because yeah. he was the writer to fear, not to say there weren't a ton of hitters in that group, but he is the guy. That's the best mm -hmm. strategy is if you can attack when the person who is the favorite is tired and then there's a little bit of a gap is Amber. Is that what, what do you think? Yep. 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 Attack when attack, when your threat is, is either tired or physically blocked. Yeah. Yeah. And <clears throat> it's just about timing. I thought it was, and that's one thing that Carapaz seems to have in spades is his ability to kind of like read that and make moves when they sting the most. He's very good at that. A very savvy racer. So <clears throat> That was cool and really cool to see. I I have a soft spot for a soft spot for South America, having a sort of mission on there and everything else, and to see a Latino Americano get a gold medal in the road race is just really really cool. Um, I think it's awesome. So, and good job McNulty for uh, yeah. finishing. I think it was sixth, right? Something like that. It's just He's crazy. impressive. I'm I'm excited for Paris when it comes to that kid. Yeah. I can never say um, Tade's last name. Pogacar. 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 Anyways, yeah. him, TP. Uh, two, he <laughs> didn't want to pull Wout up, right? He right. If he pulls Wout up, he's going to get out sprinted. And he, yeah. But he probably could have gone with Carapace pretty easily. But then he would have gone, Wout would have covered probably even more try to cover that. It's just, I love the, the game um, with game both theory. the men's and the women's race. Yeah, the game theory around it of, yeah. of having making people look at each other. No, you do it. No, you do it. And that is such a huge part of bike racing. Like, uh, outside of time trials, that's, it's giant for road racing. Oh, a hundred percent. Absolutely. If you like this video, make sure you give us a thumbs up. If you didn't like this video, you can give it a thumbs down, but let us know what you would have done differently in the comments below. If you want to see more of these videos, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. And if you want to become a faster cyclist, check out trainerroad.com. Do it.